So this, I believe, to be uh, quite an important topic, um, particularly given the current political climate, uh, for especially, for example, the terrorism, uh, which is linked perhaps to violent Islamism in some cases, and the kind of backlash it has and the kind of Islamophobic responses that it generates in places such as Paris uh, most recently. Also, given what's happening in uh, both the Middle East and the wider region, the Euromed region, uh, in terms of the refugee crisis and the kinds of responses that are coming out of some Eastern European states in response to that. Just yesterday, I saw the headline in the Washington Post, door slamming shut across Europe. So the importance of state responses to Muslims coming from places like Afghanistan, Syria, Iraq, uh, the stakes are extremely high at the moment. And here in the US, the remarks by prominent politicians like Donald Trump now about closing the borders. I never imagined that such a, a volume like this would be, in effect, a response to his comments about what is the alternative to closing the borders? How can we uh, establish a better relationship between Muslim minorities uh, and states in various countries? So you might find, looking at the executive summary, um, some parts may be controversial, some parts maybe you don't agree with, but the idea really is to establish in an academically rigorous way the foundations for a debate amongst both academics and the broader policy community. So today's talk is really about going through some of the chapters that are covered by the book, uh, from Europe to Africa to Asia, and finally talking about how these inform how we can consider state Muslim minority relations to take place, what kind of environment in which they're taking place, what kind of recommendations we can provide, and ending up with some specific lessons perhaps for the USA. So if we start looking at the UK, we see that the Muslim Council of Britain was established in 1997, quite a, a recent development. And although it started in a fairly positive context, engaging with New Labour, it quickly gave way to a securitised environment post-2003, obviously in response to the attacks of 9-11 and growing concern about radicalisation and extremism uh, in the UK as well. However, to say prevent was a narrowing of the agenda and therefore uh, perhaps a policy misstep is not entirely true. There were some elements of it, such as Minab, the mosques and imams advisory boards, which helped reduce extremism and radical preaching in mosques such as Finsbury Park. So there were elements which were useful, but it was the consistency and the lack of sustained and even-handed consistency and engagement between the MCB and the UK government, which was problematic. And that's not entirely the government's fault. That was down to perhaps certain individual cases whereby some in the MCB, for example, supported uh, the idea of jihad responses to the Israeli attacks on Gaza. So although it's been interrupted, um, that could also be remedied over time. What has also contributed to a, a decline or a, a poor environment for Muslim minority state relationship in the UK is political, media and public conflation of Muslims with terrorism. And that's happening after each separate attack, whether it's 7-7 in 2005 or the killing of Lee Rigby on the London streets in 2013. What we see sometimes is engagement from the government side following these kinds of incidents, but really it shouldn't be reactive, it should be proactive and sustained uh, over a longer period. It should be more resilient, in other words, to these kinds of uh, attacks. And the other problem is that the MCB uh, doesn't enjoy legal uh, status, legal recognition. And that means that its unofficial capacity uh, can quickly lead the government to establish alternative relationship with different Muslim groups depending on how it sees 
the engagements be effective or ineffective. And that in itself is problematic. <coughs> Austria, on the other hand, is an entirely different story. Austria has had a law on Islam since 1912. And that law has changed to cover most of the major schools of Islam since 1987. So with a long history, there's been a growing institutionalization of the Muslim minority state relationship over a period of time. And the Islamische Glaubensgemeinschaft in Österreich, the IGGIO, negotiates directly with the state on a range of matters in a very sustained and long-term way. It's both recognized and legalized. And therefore, in the book, I recommend that other states adopt this kind of model because it establishes rights and responsibilities on both sides. It means that the state has to respond to criticism, maybe in some cases, or recommendations from Muslim communities, but also individuals which are affiliated to the IGGIO are under responsibility to adopt social norms of the Austrian society and also the norms established and agreed upon by the IGGIO. So it seems fair, there seems to be a balance in this relationship which can advance a common agenda. However, this relationship isn't without some difficulties. In particular, the Austrian government has pointed to the idea of financial transfers coming into the community which are not uh, transparent and especially coming from Arab states could lead to uh, problems in certain cases. But the dependence on these financial transfers by large mosques such as a mosque in Vienna uh, hasn't yet been resolved. But that's not to say there isn't any state support for Austrian Muslims. In fact, the state has been very generous in providing provision for imam training with conditions that they learn German, and so long as they do not compromise national security objectives. And again, there's a partnership. So the IGGIO oversees the curriculum of Islamic studies taught at the University of Vienna. And 2,000 public schools teach Islamic religious instruction to 57,000 plus Muslim pupils. So there's control over the teaching, but it's also relatively freely available to Muslims that choose to receive that instruction within, emphasis on within, the state system. However, like many other societies across Europe and worldwide, there's the far right that plays a role in undermining these kinds of positive steps, particularly pointing to problematic teachers teaching radicalization at the kindergarten level, accusations of radicalization. And of course now with the Euromed migration crisis, there's growing public antipathy towards refugees and a growing Islamic phobic discourse which must be addressed. So let's turn to Africa then and look at the case of Kenya, again providing a very different perspective on Muslim minority state relations. So Kenya went through a constitutional review in 2010 but has also suffered, like many countries have, violent Islamist attacks, particularly in 2015 at Scarisa University. Why is that important? Because it undermines the push of Muslim communities to try to establish their space within the legal uh, justice system. For example, in this case, the Qadi courts, which are Sharia compliant. And so if these attacks keep happening, it actually emboldens the Christian community and other parts, secular parts of society which want to make sure that Kenya establishes firmly a European model in the mould of the British colonial system 
uh, which is basically a Christian dominated constitution and therefore Christian dominated state. Russia again. After the Islamic revival since 1991 has felt the problems associated with security issues. The securitized approach in this case has come by the Russian um, response to the Chechen war. And over time, we see that the established, the old guard uh, imams have become relatively independent and disassociated with the grassroots populations that they're supposed to represent. There's also been alleged ties to the security services, which further aligns the elites within the Muslim communities with the interests of the state rather than ordinary Muslims on a day-to-day -day basis. So the system seems to be based on the Muftiyats. There's more than 40 in Russia, which are responsible for schools and mosques. And yet there's constant accusations of corruption. So in effect, ordinary Muslims are not getting the kind of representation that they deserve. And furthermore, the law which was introduced on Islam in 2011 actually narrowed the space for Muslims to be considered to be operating within a legal framework. For example, Salafi groups are not recognized under this law and are therefore effectively illegal. So it's a highly polarized political environment in which it's very difficult to negotiate and to reconcile the interests of the state on one hand and the interests of Muslim communities on the other. And the kind of marginalization that the security environment has engendered, pushing out more than half the population of Muslims into other parts of Russia and into the West is seriously problematic. Furthermore, there's problems with ultranationalism and growing resentment towards Muslim communities and expressions of overt faith, such as festivals such as Eid al-Adha. And indeed, some mayors, for example, the mayor of Moscow, has actually banned further mosque construction. So it's not an environment in which there is a rational and constructive approach to Muslim state engagement. Sri Lanka throws up a whole host of other issues. It shows how complex and long-running these issues can be. But the factors involved in growing tensions are not only between Muslims and the state, but also between Muslims and other religious groups, uh, or indeed other ethnic groups. And most evident since 2009, there's been growing unemployment, problems within the political process itself, obviously following on from Tamil violence, but also highlighting the problem of Muslim representation in the political process and Muslim solutions to Muslim problems in the areas in which they reside. So the situation has become more grave with attacks from the Bodu Bala Sena, BBS. But really that inter-religious hostility has been apparent for hundreds of years and it's partly due to the colonial experience that Sri Lanka has gone through. So what's the solution in Sri Lanka? Well, reconciliation is based on Muslims, first of all, asserting themselves on a national political platform, trying to overcome the Islamization discourse, which has been apparent, and addressing fundamental symbolic issues, such as the flag. 
If you consider the Sri Lankan flag and the Sinhalese majority on the right represented by the lion holding a sword, and you look at the Tamils and the Muslims represented by the orange and green respectively, you can see on the one hand the lion looks to be quite aggressive and on the other hand these communities look to be marginalized. And that really in a nutshell reflects the situation on the ground. So if you can bring together within a national debate and framework progress on reconciliation and building a more cohesive national identity, then maybe we can push past these divisive political issues. Myanmar is another extreme. 800,000 Rohingya Muslims not only disassociated or decoupled from the political process, but actually are not even considered to be citizens of the country in which they reside. And it doesn't seem to be about demographic concerns. 53 million population versus 800,000 Rohingya Muslims, that's not a, a large percentage at all. It seems to be an overemphasis on uh, a particular identity and religious orientation that the country is currently following. It's marginalizing Muslims who are forced to work in places like Bangladesh and flee the country for more hospitable destinations. So in this case, what are the uh, policy recommendations? Well, if the state is disinclined to progress with solutions, then the alternative might be to look more broadly at regional organizations such as ASEAN, the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, to ask or to somehow pressurize Myanmar to adopt regional norms in this kind of area. There's also hope now Aung San Suu Kyi has won the recent election for some kind of progress in this area, although she's remained fairly tight-lipped so far. So what comes out from these different case studies? What can we learn about improving both inter-community relations and also Muslim state relations? Well, first of all, it seems to be that there's been a colonial legacy which has played a largely negative role, it's effectively blocked progress on the kinds of debates which should have taken place uh, in the past about identity, citizenship, and social cohesion. Islamist-inspired terrorism is causing conflation with Islam and reinforcing a backlash against Muslims, and that happens every time there's a terror incident. So it goes from being a short-term issue to becoming a more entrenched issue, which is harder to overcome. What are the types of best practices the book recommends? Well, looking back to Austria and thinking about a legally recognized Muslim organization which is able to engage with government on a regular basis, provide a platform for expressing opinions and concerns in a constructive way seems to be useful. It's also an area in which greater transparency can be achieved, especially in terms of foreign funding and being able to show exactly where and how it's used. And the problems are many. Unfortunately, ultranationalism, politically motivated legal decisions, competition for access to state representatives are undermining Muslim minority state relations. So what's the final recommendation here? It's about education, vital to addressing Islamophobia, vital to improving social cohesion. And how can this be linked back to the US right now? Well, it's about improving religious literacy. It should be a major objective, no matter what kind of pressure there is on resources within schools and universities these days, 
it may be difficult to achieve the right staffing levels and to get the transport funding, but actually some kind of investment in this area is also important. Why? Because the change in global society these days is towards, well, A, some recognition of others, but B, the fact that a Pew poll recently puts US awareness of Islam at just 50%. So there's huge potential to improve that. And so if you can understand other groups, you can reduce tensions with them. So again, a legalized framework in which there's rights and responsibilities on both sides. I don't fundamentally believe that the First Amendment does need to change. Because like the prohibition area, just, just because you outlaw something and make hate speech uh, covered in the broadest terms, then it doesn't actually necessarily A, address it, or B, stop that kind of hate speech from occurring. It's again about education, changing people's attitudes rather than necessarily changing the law. Thank you for your attention.